Today, as we, we focus in on our, on our message, if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to the book of is 2 Timothy in chapter 4, and we're going to launch here in just a few minutes, but before we do that, we're going to have some fun. You guys know I love the Dallas Cowboys. If you know me at all, you know I love the Dallas Cowboys, and it, it took a lot of self-control in that little um, trivia thing for me not to say who's America's team, what coach was a B-17 pilot, what quarterback went to Naval Academy, what team won three Super Bowls in the 90s. It took a lot of self-control not to do that. It did, it did, it did. But my wife made me take those questions out. No, she didn't, she didn't. Uh, oh, by the way, I've got to make it recognize somebody else. There's a, a lady in our room today in our worship gathering. She's a missionary in uh, Africa. She, uh, she walked away from a very, very lucrative career, a very successful career in the finance world in, uh, in, in Richmond and has been serving as a missionary in Kenya for a number of years. And she's with us today. Susan, would you stand up real quick? This is a really special lady. And so, Sorry about that. My ADD kicked in right then when I saw her, and I just couldn't help it. But anyway, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about disappointment. And, and if you're a sports fan at all, you might resonate with some of these clips. And the first clip I'm going to show you comes from Super Bowl X. And, and if you remember Super Bowl X, it was between the Pittsburgh Steelers and a team in North Texas. And, and the team in North Texas didn't win, but there's a great, great play. And, and I want you to watch this quick Wisconsin. play. You remember this if you watch the Randy game. Randy Hughes is out there as a fifth defensive back. Two Terry Bradshaw. For the Cowboys. Bradshaw is deep. Lynn Swan. And they're firing Look at this field. catch. Swan going after it covered. And it's Shuggle Swan catching oh. on a circus pass. Still hurts me. I think that was the first time I actually cried after a football game. And uh, there were several more times after that football game that I cried that after certain things when the Cowboys lost. There's another football game that some of you might remember. And I know there's a, I'm, one of my trivial questions was, uh, what do you call the Iron Bowl? And, and this is a famous Iron Bowl that was played at Auburn. And in, 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 in football, if you make an interception and you run it back for a touchdown, you call that a pick six. In, in, foot, in college football, there's something happened with Auburn and Alabama that's called a Kick six, and Larry Crowder, say amen, my man. I want you to watch this. He's kicking a 57-yard field goal to win the game. No time on, how much time on the clock? One second. And watch this guy named Chris Davis. Fields it at the back of the end zone. Ted Ruckner, stay in your seat. Look at him almost go out of bounds there. And you can see all the hopes and dreams of Alabama going down the drain as they lost that game. Exactly right there. I'm so, you know, there's a little bit of disappointment in watching the evil empire lose that game. It's kind of powerful stuff. And, uh, and so there's a little bit of disappointment there. Now, I, most recently, there was a, a Super Bowl, Super Bowl number 49, and this is my last video clip. This, is, uh, this was done, in, I think, in Phoenix, and uh, the Seattle Seahawks were on the one-yard line, and they had a great quarterback, Russell Wilson, out of Richmond, Virginia, and they had a phenomenal running back named Marshawn Lynch. They call him the beast because he was almost unstoppable. 20 seconds left. They're down by four to the, to the New England Patriots, and, and watch this play. Play clock at five. An interception. And they lost the game. That, that was called the dumbest play in the Super Bowl history. Another, another person said that's the worst call in the history of the NFL, in the history of the NFL. That was a, that was a monumental bad play and a bad decision for, for that offensive coordinator when he made that call and those types of things. When you think about sports and some of the disappointments that happened there, now I'm a Cowboy fan. I've been disappointed for 25 years. Uh, and so... There's a lot of disappointment that goes along with whatever team you're rooting for. But it's all in fun, and it's enjoyable, and it can be a diversion. But the reality is, for a lot of us, we go through seasons of disappointment, and we just stay in a very dark place. We find situations that take place in our marriage that we just we don't like, and we just can't get out of a situation that is very hard, and we get wrapped up into some depression, and we get wrapped up into some struggles, and things just aren't working the way we would like. Sometimes our jobs are disappointing because we're working more hours than we thought we needed to. We have coworkers that are very difficult. We're subjected to some demands that are overwhelming and it's just difficult to address some of the demands of our job and our job becomes very disappointing. Sometimes we buy new homes and we move into a new place 
and we move into that place and a, and a new roof that we thought was brand new and, and working properly starts leaking or an HVA system that somebody told us was brand new, it doesn't work after two years or, or maybe the sewage system isn't, isn't working the way it is or your neighbors who you thought were really cool aren't. And we sometimes go through disappointments in that, in that place. In our country this week, I don't know if anybody, any nation, has been more disappointed in leadership and what was taking place than, than what happened this week. I don't care what side of the aisle you are sitting. I don't care what you think about the, the Supreme Court nominee. I don't care what you think about the victim. I, I don't care about whatever side you're on. We've watched disappointment and we've seen distress and we've seen anger and we've seen hostility and we have seen frustration that you just kind of think, oh my goodness. Some of us in this room, we think that Mr. Kavanaugh is a monster and others of us think he is a martyr. Some of us see Dr. Ford as a victim and some of us see Dr. Ford as a tool of a political party. And that doesn't matter where you are and what you're seeing. We have watched friends and there are many in this room who have had wounds from sexual abuse when they were children or teenagers or young adults or college students have been ripped open and they have been reminded of the pain of childhood or adolescence or their college years, and they are struggling, struggling, struggling because of something that happened to them in their past. This has been a hard week for our nation. It's been a hard week for people who have past history. And so right now, before we say anything else, before I say anything else, I'm going to ask you if you join me in a moment of prayer and that we pray for those who are struggling because of events taking place this week. Heavenly Fathers, we take a pause right now. We understand this has been a very politically tumultuous week in our nation. We've seen things and listened to things that break our heart and concern us for our nation and concern us for our elected officials. But Father God, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to pray about that. I'm not even going to think about that. But I, I want to think about the people in this room who are struggling with skeletons in their closet, who are struggling with victim, being victimized when they were a child or when they were a teen or when they were in college. I'm thinking about young men and young women who, who've gone through some horrific situations. And Father, because of this week and watching what was going on on our 24-7 news cycle, the wounds and the pain and the angst and the anguish of, of their childhood or adolescence is just overwhelming right now. And so, Father, I want to pray that you would give grace and mercy to those who are hurting and those who are struggling. And I pray, God, that you would give them peace. Help them to find some safe people to talk to and find some places to find healing and to find hope. We make this prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can open them up to, first, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to share with you uh, several verses in this, in this scriptural narrative. And I, I'm going to start in verse 9. And I, and I need you to understand as we look at this text, this is the Apostle Paul's final message. He's written multiple letters. He's written lots of messages to people. And he sent this message to Timothy, asking Timothy to come and see him. Because Paul knows he's getting ready to die. He's getting ready to be killed He's been in the bottom of the Mamertine prison in Rome for a number of months, if not a year. He's been living in filth. He's been living in a cold, dank cell. He's been by himself except for one of his friends. And he knows that his days are numbered and he's getting ready to, to check out. And as he's dealing with a number of different issues, I think you can see... You can see a way in which he can convey to us how we can deal with some of the disappointments that we face and the disappointments that we find. This is what the scripture says starting in verse 9. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, he's deserted me and he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark. Bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. And when you come, bring the cloak that I left at Carpus with Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm and the Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too, you should be on the guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. But the Lord stood at my side and he gave me strength. 
The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We see this text and we focus in on this text. I, I, I want you to hear with me as we, we go through this and understand a, a couple of quick things that I think are very, very important for us as we address this. The first is this. In Paul's darkest moments, Paul asks for a friend, Timothy, to come to him quickly. Just Luke is with me and bring Mark if you can. When you're dealing with disappointment, whatever the disappointment what might be, whatever the struggle might be, whatever the challenge might be in your work, in your business, in your, in your home, in your school, in your church, in your government, in whatever, the first thing that we need to hold on to is the fact that healthy relationships matter. Healthy relationships matter. It was important for this man, for Paul, to have his friend Timothy come to him. It was important for Paul to recognize that Luke, the physician, was still with him. It was important for Paul to get John Mark to come with him because he said, John Mark is helpful to me. When you go through difficult times and when we go through hard places and when we are struggling with whatever it is we're struggling with, People that we love and people that we care for and people that are important to us, it's vital that we have them alongside so we can navigate through the storms that we are facing. And I want you to hold on to this idea very clearly that you find encouragement, you find strength, you find hope through people like this. Healthy relationships matter. Healthy relationships and friendships, those are vitally important. The second thing that I think Paul conveys to us in this message is this. He says, he asked, come to me quickly. And then he says, and when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. When Paul is in this prison and Paul is struggling in the bottom of this, this place, if you can imagine the the dripping down the concrete walls or the stone walls, if you can imagine the lack of sewage and the lack of ventilation, and you can ima imagine the, the rats and the vermin and all the things that are going on in that place, this is not a good spot. And Paul says to Timothy, bring my cloak. This old dude, he's cold. He's chilled. He is not enjoying the place where he is. And he says, I need something to keep me warm. We had a homeless man in our church this morning at 8 o'clock who was looking for some warm clothes and he was still shivering from sleeping outside. Friends, Paul was cold. Paul was freezing. Paul wanted his friend Timothy to bring him something. And I would say to you, the second thing that we need to consider as we deal with difficult situations is to take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. And for us, that might not mean bringing a cloak. It might mean turning off the television. It might mean turning off social media. It might mean that we start exercising a little bit. It might mean that we address our dietary habits. I, I don't know what that, that might look for for you, but Paul said, I need my jacket. I'm freezing. I'm cold. I'm sick. Bring it for me, please. Take care of yourself. Guys, when we watch what's going on in our country, or you struggle with what's going on in your work, or you struggle with what's going on at home, one of the things that we have a tendency to do is stop caring for ourselves. And that idea of exercising or walking or jogging or lifting weights or whatever it might be or eating properly, or eating right, that's just a big piece. There's a third piece that Paul addresses. When he said, bring me my cloak, he also said, bring my scrolls, bring my parchments. Basically, Paul is saying, I need you to bring me the word. I need you to bring me my Bible. I need you to bring me something that I can stay fresh in your word. I need you to bring me something that I can find encouragement, that I can find hope, that I can find life, that I can find beauty. I need, I need God's word. I need to have that. And guys, as we face what's going on in our world, I'm, I'm going to issue you a challenge today. Tomorrow is September 30th. Tuesday is going to be October 1st. There are 31 days, 31 days in the month of October. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. I want to challenge you to join me as we take one proverb a day for the month of October and just read that. And if you're on social media, 
If you find a word in that chapter that week, just post a positive word. Post a word that God has spoken to you that week because I'm convinced that as we stay in God's word and we hear God's words revealed to us that we're going to find some strength and we're going to find some hope and we're going to find some beauty and we're going to find some purpose. So as you begin the month of October, begin it with Proverbs chapter 1 and Proverbs chapter 2. And if you're on social media, connect that there as you share with your friends the strength that you're finding there. Third thing, fourth thing that Paul addresses in this situation in dealing with disappointing times. He warns Timothy about a fellow by the name of Alexander in verse 14. He said, Alexander the metal worker, he did me a great deal of harm. Watch out for him. I, I would say that there are toxic people in our world, in our lives, in our workplace, in our social media, on television, that we need to watch out for. There are toxic people who will lead you astray, who will upset you and get you worked up and you def definitely don't need that. One of the pieces that I think we need to think about is as we encounter people who are angry or people who are hostile or people who are whatever it might be, maybe we need to be careful about the toxic people that are around us. And I don't know who that is for you, but I know there are people out there that are like that. For some of us, it might be looking in the mirror right now and saying, man, I'm too negative, man, I'm too bitter, man, I'm too whatever it might be. And we need to address that on our own journey, in our own way. So Paul says this, and then he wraps it up by a fifth thing that I think is very important. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Verse 17, but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. How do we deal with disappointing times? You hold on to Jesus. You hold on to Jesus and help and find strength and find hope and find beauty and find all whatever you need in Him. The reality is, my friends, we are going to face disappointment. We're going to face discouragement. We're going to face all kinds of struggles. And guys, it can happen in your church. If you're watching the Catholic Church right now and you can see some of the abuse allegations that are being rampant, it's heartbreaking. There was a cardinal who was on television last week who said, my mother is ashamed to being a Catholic right now. And we can't just talk about the Catholics because in our own Baptist house, we can talk about some of the struggles that we've had in our Me Too summer. And we can talk about our friend Bill Hybels. And we can talk about a lot of situations where, friends, the church is going to let you down. And unfortunately, that is a reality that we have to, have to recognize. And the fact of the matter is, it's not just the church. Sometimes it's going to be our friends who are going to let us down. They're going to reveal a confidence. They're going to get angry with us when they shouldn't. They're going to do something that's going to break our heart. And we're going to be very disappointed in our friends. And that might be us in that friend relationship. And we ask ourselves, why? Well, it's pretty easy. We're flawed. We're broken. We're busted. We're messed up. And we need to find a place to forgive. And we need to find a place to move on. We saw last week that, that our government's going to disappoint us. If you're a teacher, you struggle with the education system right now. If you're a parent, you struggle in the same direction. Many people in this room have gone through a lot of different struggles in our medical system and just ask the question, why is it so hard? And we find disappointment in a lot of different places. I... Uh, took my wife yesterday to Mount Vernon to go see George Washington's home. And there's a couple that recommended this place to us and never been there. And so it was a really neat spot. And man, I, I love George Washington, especially since after watching Hamilton, Veronica and I are walking around the grounds of uh, Mount Vernon and got all these songs rolling through our head. And that is kind of cool. And we went down to uh, George Washington's uh, tomb. And if you've been there, his tomb is, is a pretty special place where the first president, father of our country, is buried. But about 100 yards away from our, his tomb, there's another place to recognize, and that's to recognize the 300 plus slaves who died under his care. And, and you walk over there and you go, wow. You kind of think, father of our country, ouch. And, and you also recognize that when he died, he freed his slaves, but not all the slaves that were on Mount Vernon were his, so he couldn't free them all. And it was a difficult sign. And, and on that marker where they recognize the slaves, there's three words written, faith, hope, and love. There are going to be things that disappoint you in life. There are going to be things that disappoint you in a church. There are going to be things that disappoint you in all kinds of areas of life. I want to tell you, 
that that word that I found on that cenotaph at Mount Vernon, faith, hope, and love, that faith that we might find in places of difficulty is simply huge. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. What is the fullness of life that Jesus wants to give? He wants to give joy and love and peace and beauty. And I think that in serving Him and honoring Him and walking with Him, that we find the wonder of serving others and the beauty of giving to others and the joy of making a difference for the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says in the book of Philippians in chapter 2, don't be anxious about anything but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As we deal with disappointment, as we deal with struggle, as we deal with heartache, what does the Bible say? It says pray. And the Bible says be thankful. That's what the Bible says. And I think that's a powerful message for us to, to wrap our brain around. What does that look like? Well, there's a lady who I called on earlier just a few moments ago, Pat Breen, who's getting ready for a pretty major surgery on Tuesday. Do you want to see what peace looks like in the face of the storm? Go talk to her. You want to see what else it looks like? There's another couple that attend our church, Chester and Nancy Smith. Nancy's terminal with a condition that's just, just she's not going to win. But if you go see her, you see joy. You see peace. You see God's grace in that hospital bed with her. What does it look like for you? I, I don't know how it's translated for you. I don't know how it's lived out for you. I don't know how it is conveyed for you. But I know it's found in the cross. As we think about what our journey might look like as we deal with disappointments, guys, how do we address it? We find healthy relationships. We take care of ourselves. We, we stay in the Word. We watch out for toxic people. And we hold on to Jesus. We hold on to Jesus. How does that look for you? How do you need to take a step in recognizing that? This morning, we're going to close with a word of prayer. And then we're going to slip right over here to baptism. And there are several people that are going to come forward and who are, who are going to publicly display their faith and their trust in Christ. And they're going to walk through the waters of baptism today. We have three kids. We have about four or five teenagers. And we have four adults who are saying this to you today, that they've made their decision to follow Christ. It doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. It doesn't mean life's going to be without challenge. It doesn't mean life's going to be without its issues. But it does mean that they're going to hold on to Jesus. Will you? If you haven't made a decision to follow Christ, I'd love to talk to you. You can stop by the Welcome Center and we'll get your information and we'll take a step from there. You can send me an email and we can connect in that capacity. But guys, in this world, you're going to have trouble and you're going to have heartache. Hold on to Jesus. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for your grace. We are grateful for your love. And today as we conclude this message, my prayer is that we would embrace Jesus in our journey wherever we are. At whatever stage of life we might be, whatever political party we might be engaged, wherever we might stand on the political aisle, that we might exude the grace and the mercy and the wonder and the joy and the beauty of Jesus. Help us, Father, to be agents of His grace and wonder as we live our lives. Today we're celebrating baptism with a number of people who've, who've made public their profession to follow you. And I pray, God, that those of us who are here today and watching this, that see this, that we might find encouragement and hope and life in their expression of their faith today. Thank you, Father, for this privilege we have to be a part of their faith story now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.